Okay, so let's talk about how, uh, how to evaluate a double sum. First of all, uh, if the notation is a little bit confusing, you're going to notice that we have these two summation symbols. Um, one is indexed by an i, the other one is indexed by a j. And the function showing up here is a function of both that i and that j. So uh, what it means to evaluate a double sum is essentially this. If we were to wrap the innermost sum in parentheses, um, then we actually deal with the, out, the sum that's outside the parentheses first in a certain sense. So basically, i is going from 1 to m here. I'd plug a 1 in for this and then evaluate this entire sum expanding using the j's. And then I would that, that would give me this sum right here. Then I'd plug in 2 for i, um, which shows up here, and then do the sum uh, as j goes from 1 to n for that function with a 2 here. And then I, I repeat that until I run all the way through from 1 to m, getting a total of m of these different summations here. I can evaluate each one of these as a normal summation. So we're not really going to have to do a whole lot of this in this class, but um, here at the very beginning, since we're using double sums in our definition for double integrals, it's worth looking at how you would evaluate one. So here's a really simple example of one that I already worked through. Uh, we're doing a double sum. The, the function that's showing up in here is i squared j. And uh, the i's were summing from 1 to 3, the j's from 1 to 4. So uh, using this, this as a guide up here, I'm going to put the innermost sum in parentheses first, j equals 1 to 4. Um, and then the outermost sum, the i equals 1 to 3, I'm going to sum this up uh, by plugging 1 in for the i here creating this summation right here. I'm going to plug a 2 in for the i, creating this summation, and then a 3 in for the i, creating this summation. So a total of three summations, um, which look near identical. The only difference is what happened to the i in each one. We have a 1 squared, a 2 squared, and a 3 squared there. Um, if you remember your properties of summations, uh, consequence of the distributive property, you can factor things out, as long as it's a constant, something that's not depending on that index j there. So this 1, this will be a 4, that'll be a 9. All of those can be pulled out of those summation symbols. And then if you notice, those kind of act like coefficients on what otherwise look like like terms. So I can combine these three summations, 1, 4 plus, one plus 4 plus 9, that's 14, and calculate this as 14 times the sum from 1 to 4 of just j. Now if you remember, this summation right here is literally just summing the numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 10. So this comes out to 14 times 10, or 140. Um, that was a very simple function to work with, and we didn't have um, a lot of, we didn't, we didn't have to count up that high for each of these summations, so you can kind of see how this would be a very lengthy process in a more complicated example. Fortunately, we're not going to have to deal with these very much, like I said. So, um, Let's now go to the definition of a double integral. So using the um, idea of volume and the, the way we kind of attached a Riemann sum to that idea and came up with an approximation for our volume. Um, in the previous video, we saw that the uh, double sum here approximate the vol approximates the volume under a surface given by f of x, y um, over some rectangle r. But if we take the limit as both m and n goes to infinity, that's increasing the number of subintervals um, that we're breaking the a, b, and the c, d into. So that's, by consequence, it's giving us uh, more and more subrectangles in that big grid, giving us better approximation. So applying this limit gives us a perfect or, or an accurate uh, volume under the surface. So now that we've come up with this definition, Fortunately, we're not going to have to use it directly very much, but um, let's try an example where we're not looking for the exact volume quite yet. We're going to start by looking for um, an estimation. So here I want to estimate this double integral, the double integral of r, or double integral over r of the function 1 minus xy squared dA. The dA here is what happens to the delta A when we apply that limit. So that dA, notice it's not referencing either variable, x or y. It's referring to the area of those little sub-rectangles, right? Um, 
we'll talk more as we kind of go on in this chapter what we do with that DA. But for now, it's just notation. So if I wanted to um, approximate this, remember we're thinking of this as the volume under the surface over this rectangle, which we define here. Uh, the x-axis, we're going to use the interval 0 to 4. And on the y-axis, we're going to use the interval negative 1 to 2. Anytime you're doing an integration problem, even whether it's an estimation or um, if we're trying to get an exact answer, usually you're starting with a sketch. So here, I'm looking at the x-y plane. And notice I drew all this ahead of time. So um, here's the interval from 0 to 4 on the x-axis and the interval from negative 1 to 2 on the y-axis. And then you'll notice we say m equals 2 and n equals 3 for this estimation. So what that means, m tells me how many sub-intervals sub to break my um, x interval into, 2, and then how many intervals to break my y interval into is given by n, 1, 2, 3. That creates a total of six little sub-rectangles here. Okay, now this, uh, the way this is stated, it's not telling me any particular way I'm supposed to go about estimating my volume. Um, and remember, part of this process is picking little sample points in each one of these sub-rectangles. Well, you can choose your sample points in such a way that makes the, co the computation easier on yourself. I'm choosing the upper left corner of each of these sub-rectangles to act as my sample points. And the reason I'm doing that is if you look at the coordinates of these points, I get a lot of zeros in my coordinates. For this particular function, that's nice, because if you notice, if either x or y is equal to zero in this function, then the integrand here just becomes a one. So for four of these points, one, two, three, four, which have zeros as uh, either their x or y coordinates, or both in that case, um, the uh, value of that function for each of those cases is just one, 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 one. Um, then if I plug 2, 1 into this function, I get a negative 1. If I plug 2, 2 into this function, I get a negative 7. Now to see what's going on here, rather than evaluate this um, integral, or sorry, rather than to estimate using a double sum the way that I wrote, uh, worked the previous example out, I'm just thinking of what these rectangles are for. Each one of these is the base of a big rectangular box, which would be standing up, so like out of the page. Um, and uh, and are bounded above by that um, by that surface. Uh, so the height of each of these boxes comes from these values here, right? It's what I got from plugging each of these points into that function. The area of each one of these little sub rectangles, which we're calling delta a, is two. It's, uh, if you look at the dimensions, it's two times one for each, each of those rectangles. So they each have the same area of two. That means rather than doing the area times the height a total of six times, I can just factor the area out, add the heights up, and then multiply the whole thing by that common area delta A, which in this case is two. That simplifies the multiplication, or the, uh, the computation a little bit. And that way I'm not dealing with some big, messy, you know, um, double summation. Um, so that's that's one way to approximate or estimate that integral. I could have chosen those sample points elsewhere and gotten different estimations. It's just uh, it's just kind of your choice how you want to choose those unless the problem tells you to do it a specific way. One thing I do want to point out, the answer that I got was negative 8. And that might initially seem a little bit confusing because the double integral is supposed to represent a volume. A uh, volume Typically, you would think of as a positive number, not a negative one. But this is actually, it shouldn't be too surprising because if you go back to calculus one, you talk about area under a curve um, and then use that to define the definite integral. We have plenty of cases where the definite integral comes out negative. And we interpret that to mean uh, that there's more area beneath the x-axis than there is above the x-axis in those cases. So this is coming out negative because on the int on the uh, rectangle that we're concerned with, at least a good chunk of this surface is under the uh, um, under the x y uh, plane, and that's specifically you, you, if you want to see where that's happening, just using the um, the rectangle here, it's going to happen at these two endpoints that we or these two um, 
sample points that we used in the, this part of the rectangle, 2, 1, and 2, 2. Remember, when I plug these into the function, the heights came out to negative 1 and negative 7. That means that the height of this rectangle is actually not coming up out of the page, it's going into the page. It's going down where z would be negative. So it's that, it's that negative, um, it's the negative values of z that are producing what we could think of as negative volume. Okay, so don't be surprised if you get negatives uh, as your answer for a double integral.